and was there in the Madan when the former leader had to take off and head up into Russia. And uh, so, you know, with the Ukrainian people, Ukrainian people have a lot of backbone. They have a lot of guts, and I'm sure you're observing it. And I don't mean just the military, which is we've been training since back when they, uh, Russia moved into uh, in, in the southeast, southeast um, Ukraine, but also the average citizen. Look at how they're stepping up. Look at how they're stepping up. And you're going to see when you're there, and you've, some, some of you have been there, you're going to see, you're going to see women, young people standing, standing in the middle of the front of a damn tank, just saying, I'm not leaving. I'm holding my ground. They're incredible. But they take a lot of inspiration from us. And you know, a woman who just died, the Secretary of State, used to have an expression. She said, we are the essential nation. It sounds like a bit of a hyperbole, but the truth of the matter is, you are the organizing principle around which the rest of the world is, the free world is moving. And we're in the midst of, and I don't want to sound too philosophic here, but you're in the midst of a fight between democracies and, 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 and oligarchs. Xi Jinping, who I've spent more time with, they tell me, than any other world leader, points out to me he believes in China that democracies can't succeed in the 21st century. The reason is things are moving so fast, change is happening so quickly, that democracies require consensus. And we can't put together consensus as quickly as autocrats can. So what's at stake, not just in what we're doing here in Ukraine to try to help the Ukrainian people and keep the massacre from continuing, but beyond that, what's at stake is what, the, what, what's, what are your kids and grandkids going to look like in terms of their, their, their freedom? What's happening? The last 10 years, have been fewer democracies have been formed than we've lost in the world. So this is a, what you're engaged in is much more than just whether or not you can alleviate the pain and suffering of the people of Ukraine. We're in a new phase. Your generation, we're in an inflection point. About every four or five generations that comes along and changes, fundamental change takes place. The world ain't going to be the same, not because of Ukraine, but I'm not going to be the same 10, 15 years from now in terms of our organizational structures. And the question is, who's going to prevail? Are democracies going to prevail and the, and the values we share? Or are autocracies going to prevail? And that's really what's at stake. So what you're doing is consequential, really consequential. And as I said uh, to a group in the dining room, you all in the chow plant, mess hall, the fact of the matter is that you are the finest, this is not hyperbole, you are the finest fighting force in the history of the world. Let me say it again. The finest fighting force in the history of the world. Part of the reason is you've had to fight so much for the last 20 years. It's for real. There are not many generations, you know, the greatest generation was my father's generation, your grandfather's generation, World War II generation. But nobody, no other generation has had to be in a battle, have your buddy blown up, wipe the blood off the Humvee and get back in and saddle up and go for another six months. Second time I flew in, I've been in and out of Iraq and Afghanistan about uh, 40 times, 30 some times, 38 times. And every time I'd go in, I'd see, like the last time I flew in, and I flew in on, a, I'm up in the cockpit when I was landing in Bagram. And I, there were six people came up with the cargo, basically, while I was flying. And I said, how many of you is your first tour of duty? Not one person raised their hand. Second tour, not one person. Third tour of duty, three. Fourth, one. Fifth one and sixth one. That's never happened before. One thing to go in and be in the middle of a battle, go home and get sent back again. And so one of the things I've said, and I've gotten in trouble for saying, but not anymore, I've been saying it from the, since I've got elected, we have a sacred obligation. Only one obligation is government. We have a lot of obligations to, to the elderly, the poor, the children, etc. Only one sacred obligation equip those that we send to war and to care for them and their families when they come home. And so you all are an amazing group of women and men. And I just want to thank you for your service. 
As your commander in chief, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. As I said, it's not new to me. I, uh, my son spent a year in Iraq. He spent six months in Kosovo. Won the Bronze Star, the Conspicuous Service Medal, and other awards. Proudest thing he ever did was put that uniform on. And like many of you, he didn't have to go either. He was the Attorney General of the State of Delaware and the Delaware National Guard. And what happened was, when his unit was going to be sent overseas, he had to go to Washington to get a, a, an equivalent of a dispensation, because you either had to be federal property or state property. He was the Attorney General of the State. He had to give up the office in order to be able to go with his troops. The point is, but there were hundreds and thousands of people like my son, like all of you. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And it's not only what you're doing to help the Ukrainian people. It's not only what you're doing to help Europe begin to gain, regain its confidence. The reason why, when the general, when the Secretary of State asked me if I'd send another 12,000 troops along to the United States, I said, yeah, from the United States. We've got 100,000 American forces here in Europe. We haven't had that in a long, long time because we are the organizing principle for the rest of the world. And I said, we've sent the best, the best available of America, and that's all of you, women and men. So I'm here, I came for one simple, basic reason, not a joke, say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your service. Thank you for who you are, and thank you for your, what you're doing. And uh, as, uh, as my grandfather would say, every time I walked out of his house, he yelled, Joey, and scrammed, he said, keep the faith. My, grand, my grandmother would yell, all kidding aside, this is serious. She'd yell, no, spread it. You're spreading the faith. Thank you, thank you, thank you. May God bless you all and keep you safe. May God protect our troops. Thank you, thank you.